morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Wilson. I'm the CEO and co-founder of The Gathering Spot. I am super excited to be here with you all this evening. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. If you're like me, you understand that we are living in quite interesting times, but we have an opportunity this November. And I'm really excited about that opportunity because we have the chance to elect John Ossoff to represent us in the U.S. Senate. And so we're going to talk today about a number of different issues. We're going to center a good part of the conversation about small businesses. But if there's anything that you want us to explore, please engage in the chat and we will try to get to those questions throughout our conversation. But thank you again. I want to be mindful of everyone's time. And so we're going to jump right in. Uh, but thank you again for this. This uh, These Georgia town halls are one of the things that in this campaign we are super excited to do. And um, I think when it's all said and done, as we continue to come together and talk about the issues that are important to us, we will make sure that John is representing us in just a few short months. So with that said, uh, John, welcome. Good to see you. How, how are you? Good to see you, man. I wish we could get together in person. Yeah, well, it's incredible that I, if you would have told me that this would have been uh, the setting that we would have to have most conversations in 2020, I wouldn't have believed you. But uh, here we are. But we're, we're going to we're going to keep pressing ahead. And um, I, again, I want to thank you for, for participating today. This is a. Uh, I'm just I'm grateful. It's it's hard, and I think we'll talk about this in uh, in a second. Some of our elected officials are, are hard to get a hold of, and and hard to to uh, contact and have that, uh, questions answered. So appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you for moderating. And look, I'm just going to take a quick second to make sure that everyone understands what you do. And for folks who are just tuning in or who haven't had a chance yet to get acquainted with Ryan or to visit the gathering spot. Ryan, first of all, Ryan and I are both Georgetown alumni. So uh, okay. we overlapped at Georgetown. So we're both Hoyas. And Ryan came back home to Atlanta and set up the gathering spot, which is an amazing, amazing establishment that is an incubator of small businesses and startups and entrepreneurialism, especially young black entrepreneurs in Metro Atlanta. Also a convening space and a meeting place where all kinds of incredible people from business, from entertainment, media, technology, politics can come together for discussions uh, of how to collaborate, how to work together, the, the issues that we face. And it's also a great restaurant and bar and cafe. So Ryan, um, props to you for setting up such a important establishment, especially for, for younger folks in, in business and media and um, the next generation of leaders across Georgia know that the gathering spot is an amazing institution. So appreciate you. And thanks again for moderating today. Oh, no, I, I'm happy to, John. I appreciate you. And and for anyone that's watching, if we could be helpful in any way, give us a shout. But um, John, if it's okay with you, I'm going to jump into some, some questions. Uh, the first one is from Susan and she's from Atlanta. She asks, my husband is a small business owner with two employees. He applied for the PPP loan and was shut out. The bank didn't ask questions about his qualifications. They just said they had already awarded all of the money. It turns out that a lot of the money went to big businesses. How can we make sure that money gets into the hands of those that need it? Yeah, well, thank you so much for the question. And uh, look, it's a story that we've heard quite a bit is that Congress appropriated the funds and there were real issues with access. Now, a lot of businesses have benefited tremendously from the PPP program and when revenues absolutely plummeted, uh, we're able to keep folks on payroll and you know keep the lights on and uh, avoid defaulting on, on property and rent and whatnot. And so the program has done a lot of good, but we've also seen some real problems with it that now as Congress should be passing another round of small business support, they've gone home on vacation having accomplished nothing, but they should be passing another round of small business support, it's really important to apply those lessons learned from the first time through to make this a smoother and fairer experience. Because the two main main uh, hangups that we heard were one, it just takes forever to access the resources dealing with the banks who are the intermediaries can be a real headache. And what we saw was that, you know, where companies had really close banking relationships and already had those personal relationships established at their banks, they were able to move through the process swifter. But for smaller businesses that maybe didn't have strong relationships with their banks 
or weren't on you know, the list of preferred clients, they just weren't prioritized. So even though Congress appropriated the money, it was difficult to access in some cases. And in, in the case of Diana, um, it was actually not possible to access. So what Congress should have done weeks ago, and like this is the thing that, that drives people nuts, Ryan, is that it hasn't been a mystery that the first COVID relief bill was going to run out, that the unemployment benefits would expire, that schools would need support in August and September. None of this has been a mystery. Yep. But Congress, and let's be more specific, Mitch McConnell and Senate Republicans, because the House passed another major COVID relief bill months ago, but it's been sitting on McConnell's desk for months. Mitch McConnell and Senate Republicans waited to the very last minute like they always do, dangling people's livelihoods and ability to make home payments and small business solvency like a, a bargaining chip. Mm -hmm. And now they just threw their hands up and went home and have passed nothing. So Congress needs to get back into session immediately. They need to pass additional small business report support. They need to make sure that every small business can access this support. And they need to make sure that larger businesses aren't poaching the funds intended for small businesses. There are so many cases of larger enterprises that already had access to all this money that Congress and the Fed have been pumping into corporate debt markets and into large corporate borrowers, also going in and getting themselves a piece of a small business pot Absolutely. at a time when small businesses are absolutely up against it and closing at an alarming rate. So uh, I, I, I feel that pain and there's a lot more that Congress needs to be doing right now to help out small businesses. I want to I want to uh, bring you a question from Diana. She's also from Atlanta and she asks specifically what can be done to support African-American and Hispanic low income communities in Georgia that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Well, first of all, we should be seeing an absolute surge of healthcare resources into the communities where there's been the, the highest impact. and. What we know is that this state's systematic neglect of marginalized and low income community health for decades, the refusal to expand Medicaid, the tolerance of this shocking maternal, maternal mortality crisis, chronic illnesses like asthma and diabetes and hypertension neglected for so long has meant that those same communities that were already experiencing a health crisis have been preyed upon by this virus, which seeks out those who are already in a weakened health state for the worst symptoms and in many cases, death. So there should be a surge of healthcare support into the communities that are getting hit harder. Don't just wait for folks to get sick and turn up for their test. Get more testing out in the communities where, first of all, a lot of working folks don't have time to go sit for three hours in their car to wait for a COVID test. We need to push that testing out into the communities. And we need to take this as a lesson. If anyone had any doubt before this pandemic that it's vital we get every single American great health insurance with affordable premiums, absolutely, cut the, the, the endless price gouging out, crack down on the insurance companies that are so abusive in their pricing and their the way they treat customers and the way they process claims. We need to get everybody covered. We need to expand Medicaid. We need to give folks access to a public health care option. And in terms of the economic impact in marginalized communities and lower income communities, this gets back to the conversation we were just having about PPP. You know, if you've got established relationships with major banks, then those funds were accessible. But for a lot of mom and pop businesses, smaller businesses, you know, talking three to 10 employees, the process was nightmarish. And so this next round of support needs to pay particular attention to making sure those who were left out in the first round can get that help in the small business community. And let's send another round of those $1,200 stimulus checks to folks. Those are lifesavers, right? For folks who are facing eviction, for folks who can't make rent, that direct support is vital. Ryan, Senator Perdue opposed even the first round mm -hmm. of $1,200 stimulus checks. He had no problem with Congress and the Fed between them giving and loaning trillions of dollars to Wall Street investment banks and major corporations. But he didn't think that it was worth the investment to send ordinary working people $1,200. And that just speaks to his priorities and the way the system is broken. 
I think that last one is is particularly important. And as we as we think about uh, one of my favorite quotes is you can't lead people if you don't love people. And I think we've got to reflect on some of the actions and and uh, decisions that we've seen over the last couple of months. I'm going to transition to a, a a question from Lillian from Elberton, and she's wondering if elected, what could you do to secure uninformed guidelines for school safety uh, and health in the presence of COVID-19? So I. And excuse me, I said, I, and it's uniformed uh, guideline yeah. for school safety and and um, and and uh, health for in the presence of twenty nine and of COVID nineteen. Yeah, well, we need strong leadership at the federal level and at the state level. So first of all, at the state level here in Georgia, we have a governor who, at this point, is almost like a non factor in the COVID response. He has sort of flip flop back and forth, trying to pander to his base, making a big fuss out of opposition to local mask policies, making that his focus. Now he's flip flopped in the other direction and is acting like he has the authority to authorize local mask mandates. We need clear and strong leadership in a public health emergency. And that also means we need clear and strong leadership at the state level when it comes to schools. You know, every school district in this state should be requiring students and teachers to wear masks where they're coming for in-person education. The science is overwhelming. And the state should be ensuring that where local districts are not able to meet CDC guidelines for reopening, and in many cases they can't because the federal government has sent no help. The federal government, you know, as I said, Congress has known schools would need to reopen in August and September. It happens every year. We've known that local districts were gonna need funding and equipment to either get to a place where they can reopen in person safely or make sure that virtual and remote learning are as enriching and fruitful as they can be, but Congress didn't act. So now these school districts don't have the resources they need to meet those public health guidelines that the CDC has set up. And the state of Georgia should be encouraging and facilitating the transition to remote and virtual learning if the school districts are unable to meet CDC guidelines. But again, Governor Kemp is sending mixed signals, not taking a strong position in the interests of public health, but trying to find the political path of least resistance in the short term. At the federal level, the failure to have passed back in June and July, emergency support for school districts is an absolute tragedy. Again, we saw it coming and they've done nothing. Uh, John, I, I I regret in some ways that I have to ask you this question, but I, but I will. What is your position on masks within the state, and what is your recommendation for everyone that's watching as it relates to wearing masks? I think that private establishments should have to require that folks coming in, if it's a grocery store, a public building, a bar, a restaurant, that folks come in wear a mask. Most states have passed such measures. Even the Trump White House recommends such measures. This is one of the most efficient and effective ways that we can reduce and slow the spread of this virus. Instead, we've gotten the exact opposite, where we've had municipal leaders like Mayor Bottoms here in Atlanta or the mayor of Savannah who have been requiring masks in public buildings and public establishments and stores and restaurants. Governor Kemp wasted like a month and a half with this lawsuit to try to overrule them while public health experts in Georgia and nationally have been urging him to pass common sense statewide mask guidelines. I don't know what folks like Governor Kemp need to see or hear at this point to be persuaded that public health experts know what they're talking about. And it's vitally in the interests of health and safety in Georgia and in economic recovery to have a strong response informed by medical science and not whatever some politician is feeling in their gut or, you know, what activists are telling them on Facebook. Our next question is from Daphne and she's from Lithonia and she asks, what are your feelings about President Trump's uh, refusing the post office funding? Hey, Daphne. And I worked off Panola Road for quite a while. So much love to everyone in Lithonia. Thank you for the question. 
I think that what we're seeing from President Trump right now is one of the most disgusting efforts to undermine American democracy in, in modern American history. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We need to empower voters to participate in our democracy without putting their own health at risk. And a lot of voters are going to be relying upon voting by mail in order to make their voices heard and to play a role in determining who leads and represents us in government. And against that backdrop for President Trump to be trying to deny the Postal Service service funding explicitly, openly, blatantly, he says it out in the open, in order to interfere with voting by mail is, is beyond outrageous. He's behaving like an aspiring despot, like an authoritarian leader who wants to interfere with the electoral process because he's afraid that in a free and fair election, he'll lose. And for Senator David Perdue, my opponent, to remain silent while the president tries to undermine election integrity is stunning to me. It's like the man has no spine no principles, no willingness to stand up and say, okay, it doesn't matter if the man's from my own party. It doesn't matter if he's my political patron. I'm going to take a stand for the voting rights of my own constituents. Instead, David Perdue is cowering in silence on the private island where he lives. Having come home from Washington for a month-long vacation without passing more support for small businesses, without extending unemployment insurance, without extending the moratoria on eviction, while his own constituents face bankruptcy and eviction and joblessness from a pandemic that he told us would pose low risk to our health and have little impact on economic growth against that entire backdrop, he's chilling at home, having accomplished nothing in Washington and sitting there silent while the president attacks voting rights. My message for voters is this, and I wanna echo Stacey Abrams who's been saying, don't panic. Yeah. Cause there's two things going on here. First of all, there's the effort to impair the operations of the post office. But the other thing is this, is this is mind games. This is an attempt to deter us from participating mm -hmm. because of a loss of faith in the system. When someone is trying to take away our voting rights, we have to be galvanized in our determination to exercise those rights and to turn out to vote by mail and early and on election day in overwhelming numbers. So I want everyone listening to mark a day on their phone, pull out your phone, pull out the calendar, make a note. October 24th is Saturday. Saturday, October 24th is mandatory statewide early in-person voting here in Georgia. You don't have to wait till election day. You don't have to go in on a work day. We can go on Saturday and vote on October 24th. And my team will also be working to make sure that everyone who wants to vote by mail in the state gets the opportunity to do so. And we will be there to defend and make sure that your vote is counted and not disqualified on some arbitrary or capricious grounds. I'd be remiss if I didn't use this opportunity to uh, highlight your relationship, but also um, continue to make sure that we remember Congressman John Lewis. If there's anything that I think we can do as a community is to make sure that we vote in November. And uh, to, to John's point, um, we cannot be afraid of participating in the process. And so, John, it, it, with with um, and speaking about Congressman Lewis briefly, can you talk a little bit about your relationship with him and and just how um, what, what you would imagine he would be saying to us, given some of the concerns around voting? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, securing voting rights and civil rights, of course, as you know, was his life's work. And he nearly lost his life fighting for voting rights for black people in the South in the 1960s. It was having read his memoir of that experience when I was 16 years old that inspired me to write him a letter and say, hey, I want to learn from you. I want to work with you. I'm I'm in awe of what you've achieved in your life. And he wrote me back and gave me that opportunity to, to come and work with him and learn from him. And he became my mentor for, for 17 years. And 
And so there are really two things I reflect on when I think about Congressman Lewis. The first is how vital it is that we persist in the struggle to secure voting rights for all, because they won incredible victories during the civil rights movement, passage of the Voting Rights Act, um, which is now under attack and has been largely undermined by forces that wanna undermine voting rights. But despite those victories, the overall victory continues to elude us. That is a society where truly voting rights are sacred and it wouldn't even cross the mind of a politician to try to disenfranchise their own constituents. That's where we should be. That we have elected officials at the state level or at the federal level who believe it's even worthy of consideration that they might abuse their power to disenfranchise their own people is truly disgusting. And I know Congressman Lewis would want us to, to pick up the torch and continue the struggle to secure voting rights. The other thing I think about when I think about Congressman Lewis impact is what he taught about how we can build a beloved community where the dignity of every human being is sacred, where we embrace our brotherhood and sisterhood as human beings, as proof that we can only achieve great things and reach our potential together. You know, he always urged us to focus on what we have in common, our common humanity. And at a time of such division, that is a healing message uh, that he continues to send us now from beyond through his life's work and all of his words and all of his, his impact on all of us. Absolutely. Um, just a quick reminder, if you have questions, please uh, do not uh, be afraid to engage in the chat below. We will do our best to get to them. Uh, this question comes live from Facebook and Patricio asks, what is your position on immigration reform? So my position is when I'm in the U.S. Senate, I will fight. And hey, Patricio, and thanks for the question. I will fight for comprehensive immigration reform at last, which secures our border and provides a path to legal status for the millions who are here without proper documentation, but otherwise follow the law. I mean, that has been the common sense way forward, literally for decades. And several times Congress has gotten so, so close, but it's been extremists in Congress who have prevented us from making that progress. We've been presented with a false choice by Donald Trump and folks like David Perdue who enable and support him. Donald Trump has tried to persuade us that we have to choose between having borders and respect for human rights. Let's be very clear. It is essential that our country can know and control who's entering and exiting our territory. That's what makes us a country. That's what borders are. And it is also totally unacceptable for our own government to stoop to abuses of human rights, ripping children from their mothers and disappearing them into federal prisons, brutality against detainees and migrants. Mm -hmm. That's contrary to, to everything that we believe in as Americans. We can have secure borders and uphold our commitments to human rights, and we can pass comprehensive immigration reform that will provide a path to legal status for those without documentation who follow the law and that will protect the dreamers permanently. DACA recipients should not be living in this constant state of limbo where they get temporary protective status, but depending upon who's in charge, suddenly they could face deportation again. Young people who have grown up in this country, who were brought here as little children, who are Americans and who live under the shadow of this threat that one day their protection could be revoked and they could be sent somewhere where they've never lived. So let's pass comprehensive immigration reform, secure our borders and protect our dreamers. Uh, John, we're going to we're going to uh, transition to talk about Social Security. And so Barbara from Pre Street Corner, she asks, what can we do to protect Social Security and Medicare in regards to payroll taxes? Hey, Barbara. And hey to everyone in Peachtree Corners. And by the way, I love that we're still able to get these this live conversation going with folks from across the state. It's so important. And I hope everyone listening knows that 
as your senator, I will be right back here virtually and in person to answer your questions, to account for my conduct, to explain my votes and to hear your criticism because that's what public service is about. Absolutely. So thank you, Barbara, for the question. Look, the most important thing we can do to protect Social Security and Medicare is win in November, period. Because Donald Trump has just said that he wants to cut off funding for the Social Security Trust Fund. And David Perdue has made no secret since he started running for office back in 2014 that gutting the system into which seniors pay their entire lives because our country has made a commitment that our elders should not be left destitute or in poverty or without health care. David Perdue has made it very clear that he fully intends to attack that system. And the only way that we can ensure that seniors continue to have access to those vital benefits, again, which they have paid into for their entire lives, is to defeat people who right now are threatening to cut off funding for Social Security and Medicare. So um, unfortunately, this is going to be one of our last questions, but um, Lindsay, Lindsay from um, Peachtree City, and excuse me, I, so many Peachtrees in, in Georgia. Um, um, our question is, what would you say is the best piece of advice for young people who genuinely want to make the country and this world a better place? That's a great question, Lindsay. That's a beautiful question. My advice to, to young people who, uh, who ask me for my thoughts and who are considering which way to go, what career to pursue, how to make decisions. You know, do, do you make the career choice that's um, right in front of your eyes? Do you wait until your dream job comes along? Do you pursue your passion? Do you pursue uh, the economic circumstances that you like? They're not always aligned. A lot of young people struggle with these kinds of questions. And my advice, and it sounds cliche, but it's 100% real, is to do what you love if you can because for those young people who are trying to make a difference in this world, and there are so many, and one of the reasons I'm so hopeful about our state and our country's future is that fresh attitude that young people today bring to the conversation, the sort of moral clarity and the real excitement about what we can achieve together. I tell folks to do what they love if they can. And when we are following what we're, when we're doing what we're passionate about, and I know Ryan, this is this is what you've lived. You know, you you've poured your heart and soul into your startup, not because it was the easy path, not because it was the path to immediately make the most money, but because it was what you felt called to do. And we will do our best work when we are pursuing and fulfilling our calling. John, I want to thank you. And and again, I appreciate your leadership uh, sincerely. We are living, as we started this conversation, in, in troubling times. But I think the optimism that your campaign and that uh, the leadership that you will bring to Washington, it, it just it gives me hope. And so uh, for everyone that joined us today from Peachtree City to Peachtree Corners, Elberton, Lithonia, and where I am in Atlanta, uh, thank you for engaging uh, with us this evening, but also for being a part of this campaign, if there's one ask that I have is that campaigns need resources. And uh, it, it is amazing what uh, what the Ossoff campaign has been doing thus far. But our opponents in this uh, in, in this race are, are, are spending a ton of resources making sure or to try to make sure that we one won't make it to the polls, but that we also won't have the resources to be able to see John in office. We've got to make sure that, that neither one of those things happens. So. Please, if you can, encourage your friends and your family and anyone that you know to support this campaign at electjohn.com. Um, we, we will continue to do these conversations until election day, but John, it was good to see you. I appreciate you spending some time with us on a Sunday. Good to see you, Ryan. Thanks for doing this. And look, to everyone who threw questions into the comments we didn't get to, um, thank you for being here. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but we're doing these every week taking live questions from folks and appreciate your interest. Appreciate everyone's participation. Much love to everybody. Stay healthy. And Ryan, thank you again. See you soon.